may be seated. And I'm going to invite you to take your Bible with me tonight, please. And let's turn over to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11. And uh, when you turn to Matthew 11, what you're going to find is that Jesus is uh, he's pronouncing some terror, some woes upon cities that he had much ministry in. So Matthew chapter 11, uh, verse 20, Jesus begins to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done. Why? Because they didn't repent. He says in verse 21, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they'd have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, they would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Drop down with me to verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I don't think that any country other than Israel has had as much of God at work and God's blessing upon it than our nation. When you think of the many years that uh, we have existed as a nation and how we were birthed, the hand of God was providentially at work in the founding of this nation. I want to share with you some thoughts that I believe the Lord would have me to do in anticipation of what we're going to do when we come together on Sunday. Because I believe that if we are going to have any real, any successful time on Sunday when we meet together to pray, if we're going to pray for this city, if we're going to pray for our nation, then we have to have God's heart to do so. That's the only way we'll ever honestly pray and see God work. I believe that God has a will for this city, that God has a will for this nation. And I think that he lets Christians that are in tune with him know what his will is. I think that's why when he teaches his disciples to pray, he said, when you pray, pray this. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. He wants us to pray on this earth what God desires to see done here. To put it in another way, I would say this. God wants to burden our hearts with what his heart is burdened with. Do you believe that God's heart is burdened for this city? Do you believe that God's heart is burdened for the, the cities of this nation and for the nations of this world? Do you believe that God's heart cares and is burdened for them? I think so. So my question is this. If we're going to be ready to really pray to the Lord for our city here and the cities of our nation, how do we get the burden of God into our heart? How does that transfer take place? I want to share a few thoughts with you. Let's pause a moment and pray. Our Heavenly Father, you were burdened for these cities. You sent your Son to these cities in Israel. And he preached the word to them, and they rejected the word. 
and you pronounce judgment on these cities. Well, Lord, you said if Sodom and Gomorrah would have had the message that these cities had, they would have repented. Well, Lord, they would have repented if they would have the messages that have been preached in this city and in this nation over the years, and yet it's been rejected. And we are facing your judgment if things don't change here. So, Lord, we pray tonight that you would put a burden on all of our hearts. We can't, we can't fake it. We can't work up a burden ourselves. But we are asking that you would transfer from your burdened heart to our heart. That we might be able to gather together here on Sunday and have a genuine prayer of crying out to you a God-given burdened heart. Lord, may that happen. Use our time here tonight to grab hold of our hearts and to open our spiritual eyes and use this as heart preparatory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I believe that if we are going to have the burden of God on our heart, there has to be several things that come together. And one thing that I've thought about is there has to be what I would call identification. And there are several parts that relate to this. The first, the, the, the first part of identification I'm thinking about is that there is obstruction in the way. If we're going to have God's burden in our heart, the obstruction has to be removed. We have to accurately identify the problem or we can never pray. What would you say is the outstanding need in New York City? Is it that uh, our financial problems would be solved? Is the greatest need our education system? Is the greatest need in this city uh, the policing problem or... Uh, racial issues? I think you and I, who are believers, would all agree that the greatest need in New York City is a spiritual and a moral problem. That we are bankrupt as a city spiritually and morally because we've kicked God out of our city and we, like a, a bunch of prodigals, have run away from God, we've taken the blessing of God, so to speak, and we've just selfishly squandered it on ourselves. God's blessed us. That's one area of identification I, I want us to identify. There's another second area, and that is, okay, then what's the solution? Because once the problem has been properly identified, then we are able to identify what the solution is to relieve that obstruction, to remove that obstruction, to determine what's the answer to the problem. And since the greatest uh, need is a spiritual and moral need, then the only thing that can change that is a change inside, is a change of heart. And I'm happy to say that that is an area that God specializes in. And he's the only one that can change and touch the heart of human beings. And I think that the solution is that we really begin to ask God to change people's hearts. Because all of the reform and all of the changes in these other areas is not the remedy. It's a heart issue. And that brings me to a third area of identification that I think we should think about, and that is it, this. It is impossible to pray for people that you yourself can't identify with. I want you to think about three particular passages. They're all in the Old Testament. And they are key prayers in the Old Testament. 
And what's easy to remember is these three prayers, prayed by three different men, are all in the ninth chapter of the book that they appear in. For instance, I'm thinking about Ezra chapter 9, Nehemiah chapter 9, and Daniel chapter 9. In those three chapters, you're, you're going to see men that pray for, in this case, the nation of Israel, but when they do so, I want you to listen to the, to the personal pronouns that are used. Listen closely as I read. This is Ezra chapter 9. I'm at reading verse 6. Here's what he prays. Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespass is grown up to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have our kings, our priests, been delivered into the hands of the kings of the lands, and to the sword, and to captivity, and to spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is unto this day. And I mean, I could go on. Notice the personal pronouns. Listen to Nehemiah chapter 9 as he prays. Uh, and in the 33rd verse, here's what he says in his prayer. How be it, thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. And then there's the personal prayer of Daniel. In the ninth chapter of Daniel, listen how Daniel prays. Daniel 9 verse uh, uh, number 4. As he sets his face to pray, I prayed unto the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even from departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets. And uh, again, many more. Listen to uh, 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 down a little bit, uh, a little further. Neither have we we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they may not obey thy voice. And a curse is poured upon us. We have sinned against Him, against God. He says over and over again. These men, when they pray, include themselves as part of the problem. And that's the point that I want to make. When we talk about identification, not only do we have to identify the obstruction and identify the solution, but we need to also identify the inclusion. That is, that we're included in this. That uh, there is collective guilt. It's not just so-and-so's fault. It's not just the lost people in this city and in the cities of this nation. It's not just the politicians. We, there's collective guilt when these men pray. And if we think ourselves better and we look down on others when we pray, we don't get it. God's not going to work in that. We need to see ourselves as one of them and, in, and to some degree as contributing to part of the problem. You know, when Israel was dancing around that golden calf in idolatry, Moses had nothing to do with that. He was up on the mountain meeting with God. But when Moses comes down and he begins to, to intercede on the behalf of Israel, in Exodus 32, 32, there is only one instance of this in the entire Bible. He, he asked God to forgive their sin. And then there is in the Bible a hyphen, a dash. And then he says, and if not, then blot me out of your book. And that, that space is, I don't know what's going on in his, in his mind, in his heart, but he's obviously very distressed at this and, and he, he's, he's begging God, but he is also saying, look, if you're going to judge them, then judge me with them. And he puts himself 
in with the group, even though he had nothing to do with it. Do you think that Daniel was an idolater? Do you think that Daniel had strayed? Like, but he prays and he says, we, 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 our. Or Paul, he could wish himself accursed, he said, for the Jewish people, his kinsmen, he said, according to the flesh. Identification, I think, is one of the first places that we need to think about if we want that burden transferred from God's heart to ours. But then a second thing is examination. That is to accurately determine the current conditions and what God's will is regarding them. By that I mean this. Look at the severity of the day that we live in. How bad is it anyway? Is the severity of the current conditions that we are living in, do, do, does it demand that we intercede in prayer for our city, for the cities of this nation? Does God call us to intercede? Now, I, again, I know that this verse is the prophet Ezekiel, and he's referring it to the people of Israel, where God says through the prophet, I, I looked for a man to stand in the gap. And I found none. In that day there was none to stand in the gap that God would spare his judgment upon Israel. Is there any amongst God's people that would stand in the gap, say for this city? God's looking for people. Does God promise that if we will stand in the gap, that he will work if we ask him to? I think that both the Bible and history itself will prove out the fact that if we are willing to be a people that would uh, recognize the severity of the times that we live in and the need to intercede on the behalf of the people that God has put us in the midst of, that he'll work. I think this examination not only pertains to the severity or the condition of the day that we live in, but also the sincerity of our hearts. Is there a genuine desire on our part to intercede on the behalf of this city? Because if there isn't, then who is going to do it? If God's people don't have a genuine heart desire to intercede on the behalf of New York City, then who is going to stand up and intercede? Sincerity. Is there anything in your life that the Holy Spirit would point to that hinders you from a heart of intercession, from interceding on the behalf of the people? In James chapter 4, James says, if you'll draw an eye to God, he'll draw an eye to you. Then he says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, you, you double-minded. You know what double-minded is? <laughs> you're not single-minded. If you're double-minded, obviously, you're not single-minded. You know what it means to be single-minded? To be focused on what? I wonder if you'll dedicate yourself to intercede before the Lord on the behalf of New York City. As Abram dedicated himself to intercede on the behalf of Sodom. You got any family or friends here in this city that you're concerned about? You concerned about the direction they're going and where they're going to spend eternity even? Is it worth interceding for this city? And then there's a third area, not only identification and examination, but also, thirdly, communication. God initiates all communication. Prayer is communication, right? God initiates all communication with human beings. And there's two parts to this that I want to touch on briefly. First of all, in communication, you've got to connect. You have to realize that God desires 
to have a relationship with you personally and to enjoy fellowship with you personally. God desires that. He wants that. There are two main ways that God communicates with us. Let me give them to you quickly. The first way is God communicates with us objectively. By that I mean through the Bible, through biblical truth. That means that if God is going to communicate with us in this way, then we have to regularly expose ourselves to the Scripture. Otherwise, how are you going to hear? You have to expose, and when you do so, do it sincerely so that when God speaks to you from it, you hear what's important to him, and you're saying in your heart, okay, God, I get it. You helping me, I'll do it. Then the second way God uh, uh, communicates, connects with us, is not only objectively through the word of God, but also subjectively through the Holy Spirit's still small voice or his whisper deep inside of you in your conscience. But the Holy Spirit's still small voice is, is directly corresponds to the, to the Bible truth that you know. And God reveals his will so that you'll do it in your life. If you don't have a heart to do, God's not going to reveal his truth to you. If you have a heart to obey, God's going to open his word to you and you're going to hear it. You're going to hear what he says. Objectively, subjectively. Communication is about connection, about connecting with him. But also, it's about conversation. It's about conversing with him. When we pray, prayer needs to be a two-way street. Prayer needs to be a mutual interaction. I know that's not how we think about prayer. We think about prayer, it's us doing the talking and God doing the listening. That's part of prayer. But prayer is actually both. It is both talking to God and listening to God too. Prayer is, a, is conversing. It's a conversation. And if it's a conversation, it means that both people are talking and not just one. It's a two-way street. It's not only you talking to God, but it's you and I stopping long enough to ask God what he wants to say to us and then to pause long enough to hear what he has to say and then agree with him and obey it. You know what? I'm talking to the Lord. I say, Lord, I don't want to do all the talking. I'm talking too much here. Let me stop a minute. What do you want to say to me? What do you have to say to me? Lord, about this that I've been asking, what's your answer to this? What, what do you want? How do you want me to approach this? What do you want me to do about this? I'm talking about how to have the burden on God's heart transferred to your heart through identification. And, of course, by that, let me re review, remove the, uh, identify the obstruction in the way, the problem, and then the solution, and then the inclusion of yourself. You're part of the problem. I'm part of the problem. And then examination, the, the severity of the, of the day that we live in, and with sincerity of heart, and then the communication, connecting, conversing with God. I believe these are three parts of how that burden goes from God's heart to your heart. John Knox, he was a famous Scotsman. He was a preacher in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, St. Giles Church, it still stands today. And you can go on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh and you can visit the house of John Knox where he lived. He was a great man of God. And he constantly carried a burden for the land of Scotland. And night after night, he would, he would uh, he'd pray on the wooden floor of his hideout where he was taking refuge from uh, Bloody Mary, Queen Mary. And when his wife pleaded with him to get some 
rest. He answered, how can I sleep when my land is not saved? And it said that Knox would, would, uh, would pray all night in agonizing tones, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. And guess what? God did. God shook Scotland and uh, God gave him Scotland in a spiritual way. It underwent revival. Now I know that you're not John Knox and you're not supposed to be. I understand that. But Jesus said, take my yoke upon you for my burden is light. My burden is light. When God transfers the burden from his heart to yours, even though it's a heavy burden, it's light. God's burden, someone said, is like a bird's wing and it empowers you to be able to soar. And I want us to soar in our prayer for this city and for the cities of this nation. I want us to have that burden that Jesus said we're to take. Take my yoke. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Heavenly Father, I pray that you might Help us to think on these things and to really consider the need to have your burden transferred to our heart. Otherwise, our prayers are not going to be really what they ought to be. So, Lord, show us, show us from your word. Communicate with us. Help us to examine and identify properly. Identify with you and the burden of your heart. Lord, give us such a heart cry that we would even be a people that would say, oh God, give us New York City. Or I don't even want to live. Give us that kind of a heart burden to see you work. We can't, again, muster that. We can't make that happen, but Lord, we're asking you to do in us what only you can do. And we're asking it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's uh, take our hymnal one more time. <clears throat>